first I thought I would give a quick intro to the whole concept that this is the first of hopefully multiple things that we're calling shop talks from uh, hosted by the Ladies Fellowship, but just from assorted women in the church where we want to be, as you know, the Ladies Fellowship is all about the Bible reading challenge and read the word and be in the word and encourage one another to be in the word. But we also want to be very Titus too in the fact that we think that reading the word actually changes the things that you're doing in your life, that it touches down in your life. And since Titus 2 is all about the older women teaching the younger women very practical things, uh, we thought just some shop talk talking about specific application uh, would be good. And I think in the Lord's providential timing, the topic for tonight chosen weeks ago was hospitality. And uh, growing up, whenever we would have a hard, whenever the church was going through a hard phase or a difficult moment or a lot of controversy where we were all over the front page of the daily news. Never, uh, <laughs> never happened. <laughs> never before yesterday. Um, yeah, just, so it, whenever that would happen, one of the things that my parents specifically focused on is let's double down like uh, better wine, more beautiful meals, more rejoicing before the Lord, more laughter around the table. It's like we know that there are these trials. We know there are things happening. But what we want to do is express our confidence in God. And doing that around a table, is it's a beautiful way to do it. So in God's providence, we're talking about hospitality on the day between our two psalm sings where people in our church are getting arrested. Perfect. <laughs> so I think it couldn't have been more appropriate, but also just a general admonition and encouragement that this is how women fight to build the kingdom, like feeding people, loving those people around you, rejoicing around the table uh, is a wonderful contribution to something. And it fits right in with the other things uh, that we're doing. Okay, so I, what we're going to do is I wrote some questions that they have seen. Doesn't So if they look surprised, it's... <laughs> Not my fault. <laughs> um, and we're going we're gonna to talk through those. Of course, the, the initial thing I want to say is 1 Peter 4, 8 through 9. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Uh, so, of course, we know God has commanded all of his people to be hospitable, but we want to make it clear that the reason we're talking about large group hospitality is because that's just a specific thing to talk about, not because we think every Christian is called to large group hospitality in every phase of their life, no matter what. You have to have big groups over all the time. Uh, this is just, and it's also because it's a really hard thing to find information about. If you're looking for how to feed four people dinner, the world is at your fingertips. If you're looking for how to feed a big group, it's actually very difficult uh, to find out. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, I want to introduce our guests. I'll start with Jan Sawyer. Jan has been in our church for a long time. How? A long time. Since 1986. So I, one blessing of our church is that there were so many different women we could have asked to be on this panel. And these were the victims that I, that I got to first. Uh, but I think most of us sort of grew up together. That was an accident within a, you know, I mean, that I chose people who grew up together. But I think all of us in our youth enjoyed the hospitality at Jan's house. <laughs> and now Jan has two daughters that are very hospitable, doing it all the time, and granddaughters that are up and coming in that scene. She's, she is a wonderful hostess. Then we had Katie Grauke, who is a wife to Isaac, mother of four, five, mother of five, and she caters, and she caters beautiful and good food. So we're looking forward to her input. Uh, Mackenzie, mother of six. This is really a pop quiz for me. I shouldn't have done this on the microphone. Uh, mother of six teaches at Logos, also very hospitable. Mackenzie is the person who says, I like to invite the families with lots of kids over right away when I see them in our church, because I know that those groups intimidate some people. <laughs> She's right. They do. Uh, my sister, Becca, does a lot of the NSA events. She's, she's been here since birth. She's, she's, she's always before. been here. Uh, and Carolyn, were you born in Moscow also? Also since, since birth. Yeah. Carolyn helps Becca with a lot of NSA things. Carolyn is the person who makes 
extravagant gelatos and cakes and things that impress us all on, on Facebook. So that's who we have gathered today. And probably and the at people NSA who events. eat them too. I'm I not mean, always invited not to those, just the virtual though. I mean, people. that's what I'm really here, you know. <laughs> that's why I asked her to come so that I could try to get on the list. Okay. Okay, so uh, our first question is, do you just always feel like being hospitable? I want to start. I want to start with you, Jan. If you grab the, yeah, grab the. If you would answer this one, and and if you don't hypothetically not feel like, if you if it ever happens that you don't feel like being hospitable when you need to be, what do you do about it? Well, I'll tell you when when you have an event and you're getting ready for it. There's a moment where you say, why am I doing this? <laughs> why did I say I would do this? So that's too late because they're coming. <laughs> so you're, you're in it, but um, there's a blessing in the end. If I don't feel like it, well, it's too late. It's too late. <laughs> you, just, you just buckle up and go? Yeah, you're like, you have to. They're you, coming. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a friend who says, my past self must have thought that this was important. Yeah. So I'm going, to, I'm going to trust that my past <laughs> self had a point when I put this on the calendar. When it was young. <laughs> yeah, anybody else? Do, you, do the rest of you always feel hospitable? So I, um, I try to circumvent this by inviting people last minute to things. So, <laughs> because then you don't have as much time to A, freak out about it, and B, um, regret it. So <laughs> I figure if I can invite you in the morning for that night, then I won't realize that inviting multiple large families all for the, that <laughs> evening when I also was doing a sporting event after school was maybe a bad idea because by the time I realized that it's already 11 at night, so it's over. So I feel like this might be unanimous. Chair. Just make it so you it's too late. You can't think about it. <laughs> And it, Becca, do you have something to say about this? Do you always oh, feel I hospitable? I just totally second Jan because it's like you're always like, what was I doing? <laughs> what was I thinking about? <laughs> but, oh, well. These are, I, I feel like it's like the mind games of a long race. Like there is a phase before you get a second wind where you're like, I can't do it. It hurts. I can't breathe. This is the worst thing ever. And then if you just keep going faithfully, you pop out the other end of that emotion. But keeping moment. going faithfully means confessing your sins in that moment. Yeah. Because well, it'll yes, it could be worse. You're always there's a moment where you're looking at the fork in the road. Like I could just fall into sin and go real bad. <laughs> or kind of everything. I could just confess it now. Shall I do that? And, or shall I not? <laughs> yeah. Better if I did. Yes. Yeah. Any anybody else have something they want to add to this? It, I I'm just going to echo it cuz that's exactly how I feel. I still remember the time in England that we had a Christmas party and I was 8 months pregnant getting ready for it with English people coming and my 2-year-old threw up on the living room rug <laughs> 5 minutes before. And I'm scrubbing it pregnant and meant no makeup was going to happen. And God's going, "Yep." <laughs> Guess what? But the food's done. The food is done. It's going to be good. And it's not about you. <laughs> and it was a huge reminder. And, and my husband was helpful in that, too. And we had a lovely evening. And I did not tell anyone about the rug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Katie, did you want to say something about that? Well, if I feel stressed right before and wonder if I was making a bad decision, I enjoy a half a glass of white wine. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> it helps a lot. <laughs> Or, or just a good, a good moment of reflecting that this is not that big of a deal. Like, usually you get really whizzed up about something that's not that important. You know, like if you have to say the dessert failed, just imagine a dessert right now. It's not going to kill anyone. It's okay. You know, you can, you can, and a lot of the time you can throw your attitude overboard for something that's really not, uh, that important. I will say, I think one of the, it was an accidental prayer that I thought turned out to be far more, it made, it was important in my own hospitality life. It was a moment where I was big time, not in the mood or things weren't going well. I can't really remember which probably I was behind schedule and a crowd is on their way to my house and I'm just not feeling as at like I am ready enough to have them all start coming in or the first early guests arrive and you're like, what? 
<laughs> what have you done? And I, I just, however, it was a difficult moment. And I remember, I knew that I had to wrangle my own attitude about it. Like, I'm just aware of this is going in the wrong direction. And it was sort of an accidental prayer. But I, I remember thinking, okay, what do I need to get right? And it was, it's not like, Lord, help me to get it all done. Lord, make it all come together. I just, all, all of a sudden, I prayed, Lord, be my guest. Like, Lord, this is for you. I have guests coming. If it was the Lord coming, and actually it is. He's actually already here. Like, he's already witnessing my hospitality. Uh, and that simple phrase is something that I have come back to many times. Like, whoever the guest is, treat it as though it is the Lord coming. And it does help. It does help get a little grip on things. Okay, second question. What is the biggest spiritual lesson you have learned through practicing hospitality? Do someone want to raise their hand that they want this question? I don't want to pin it on anyone all of a sudden. Bega? <laughs> I'll tune in. Um, I think realizing that there's a lot of things that you have to be willing to just let go of and have it not maybe be your biggest shininess moment. <laughs> you know, like everything might not be the, you might have vomit on the rug. It might not be your favorite smell that happened <laughs> when people show up and, and just being willing to let go of it and just pray that God uses this the way he will use it. And it's not about being Martha Stewart mm -hmm. because who of us can. That's <laughs> <laughs> Great tip, great tip. Um, so when I was first married, my husband and I lived overseas for a year, and uh, we really felt um, whenever we got invited to someone's house, it was so amazing because we didn't have any family. We didn't really know people. We were a really weird couple because we were in our early 20s and we had a baby, which was very strange. Um, it was basically like we were 14. And so we didn't really fit in. It was hard to find kind of a social group that really was the same as us. And so whenever we did get invited over, it was like Christmas Day. We were so excited to go fellowship with Christians. And um, whenever, kind of a little bit going back to that first question, whenever I'm thinking like, do I want a relaxing evening at home or should I just last minute, because that's what I do, impromptu invite this giant family over that I just met and feed them whatever I can wrangle up in two hours. Um, I just try to remember those moments when I've been hugely blessed by hospitality. And it's not really just feeding you a meal or getting some fellowship, but it's just feeling like someone actually is pouring into you. And um, I'm, I'm not in a foreign land anymore, but I remember so strongly what that felt like and what a huge difference it made. Um, and I'm actually getting emotional about it, which is surprising. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. So but anyway, that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Go for it. Did you have some? Well, I talked to my daughter Paula about this, and she said, "Just don't panic." There's that minute before, and things are a mess or a surprise, and it's like you can get out of fellowship so fast by kids, put things away, <laughs> clean up. So I would say, um, don't panic. <laughs> Be prepared. And I would say, remember what it feels like to be a guest. And remember, it isn't about you as the hostess. This has already been said. But what a blessing it is for the guests to come in. And you may see all the imperfections. But they don't. They don't taste it. They don't smell it. They just. Or they don't care. They, they don't see care. it and it doesn't mean They're anything just so to them. They're thankful to be invited to somebody's house. Yeah. So echo that because you might see all the smudges on the door. They're not going to see that. But if you're having a weird spat with your husband, they'll see that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sometimes think the Lord ordained, you know, this, the time of year when you have people over and then the sun gets just to the right angle. So not until after the guests are in the house does it light up the handprints and the dust and bunnies. The dust bunnies. And, the, and people have come over and you're just looking around. You're like, what happened? I, cu I couldn't see this moments ago. And now all my windows are lit up like a big smudge fest. Yeah. But I have been in the room with like a husband yeah. and wife having this really bizarre crackle going on. Nothing is more awkward than that. <laughs> and there's nothing awkward about being in somebody's house if there's a smudge on the wall or the baseboards weren't dusted. 
But that's extremely awkward if they're snapping at their kids or mm -hmm. trying to like, you know, apologize for their kids to you or being passive aggressive at their husband. Like that's, yeah. that's the worst, most inhospitable thing you can do to a guest really is getting yourself stressed and out of fellowship and grumpy at everybody. So. What was the question? It was what was your what was your biggest spiritual yes. lesson that you. you've learned through hospitality? Um, yeah, actually, it's funny how we are. You're going to see some overlap probably because you know <laughs> we kind of learn these things as we all go. But but it was um, it is not yeah it's not about me. It's not about how people perceive me. I had a tiny little house in England, like tiny. My kitchen I could swing on the both counters, and I did because I could, <laughs> but, but you have people over and, and I could be really self-conscious about that. And I had to, I had to kill it. Um, even though you would hear people cause they were, we lived in a community where we were 40 years younger than everybody else. And so they were not, um, they would be very loud, not realizing that they were, you know, so I would have these little old ladies from church over often. Oh, why'd she do that to the living room? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I had to laugh. I just had to laugh about it. It was funny. And now we're back here in the United States, and it's still not about me. And um, and I'm echoing all of what they're saying of remembering that um, that this is so good for me. Actually, it's, it is humbling. Go, yep, didn't clean that. Probably should have when I noticed it two days ago. <laughs> Done now, and that's okay. But I guess I would add to that of I also shouldn't sit there and apologize for everything. Um, oh, I'm sorry, and this is a little burned, and the tablecloth, I didn't iron it, and I did, you know what? No, nobody wants to come in and go, well, why are we here? Then yeah. if you're going to point out all your flaws to me, because that's about me too, you know, so just roll with it. Yeah. That's like, I just wanted to make it clear that I'm better than my own hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> I am better than I'm this. Better and, and not that I would never say anything, but the older and more experienced I get, the less likely I am to apologize for something weird at my house. <laughs> like <laughs> I might sit down and be like, Hmm, that is not the best potato I ever had. <laughs> but I just feel like nobody wants to talk about it. That's the thing is you're just going to put everybody else on the spot. Um, I would say my biggest spiritual lesson through practicing hospitality has been that in scripture, we often think of practicing hospitality is a gift to other people because it is a gift. I think my big takeaway lesson, though, has been that practicing hospitality is a refining fire to the hosts and hostesses who are doing this to honor the Lord and that it is a spiritually rich field to go into, not because you're just giving wonderful gifts to everybody else, but because God gives us wonderful gifts in the things that we learn through practicing it. It is, it is like all Christian charity and love that it is, it is more blessed to give than receive because you're receiving from God in the blessing that it is to give. And it's, and that's a wonderful uh, thing. So I think my biggest feeling is like, if it ever starts to feel too easy, I'm like, brace yourself. <laughs> something is coming. <laughs> there's there's going to be something where I'm like, wow, back in the hospitality kindergarten again. Got to go back and do this. Uh, okay. Scripture commands us all to be hospitable, but other than without grumbling, it doesn't specify exactly what it should look like. Has your own hospitality changed through the years with seasons of life? And well, I'll just ask that first. Has your own hospitality changed through seasons of life? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How, or, uh, well, the second half of this is, what has that taught you about the nature of hospitality? Or in general, do you have any thoughts about how it should change through your life? Yes. I think you have to do it, just do it when you're young and learn because you will get more relaxed, but you won't know that if you don't start when you're young. <laughs> um, so I would say just just jump in and do it. Not maybe a crowd of, what were you talking, like 20? You might yeah. not start that way. But um, I would say just learn from your mistakes, and you won't make mistakes unless you do it. <laughs> so jump in <laughs> and learn, and it will change. You'll get more relaxed. Um, you'll order chicken from Winco <laughs> when you have a crowd of 80 for 4th of July and you are more focused on the 80 people coming than what you're cooking. So it does get easier. 
I talk about my bandwidth a lot as a mom, and there's certain there have been certain periods of my life when I've been pregnant, nursing, toddlers running around all the time. It doesn't even occur to me to make dessert, ever. I just buy ice cream. Like it does not even occur to me. I would never bake. So that's just like a small example. And I think that it's appropriate to recognize what phase that you're in and start small in the sense, sometimes it's not even a small crowd, but it's a small amount of cooking. So you do a potluck. That's a lot of work. Coordinating a potluck, cleaning up after the potluck. That is a lot of work and that's plenty for some people. But if that gets your foot in the door and it's like a workout, it's a lot of work right at first, but then you kind of get in your groove and it does get easier and then suddenly Two years later, you realize, oh, I feel like making apple crisp for 40 people. I don't know what just happened. Oh, it just happened. I just made it. And it just, that's the bandwidth thing. And right. it, it shrinks and expands and shrinks and expands, mostly having to do with kids and sports schedules and all that. But that has proven to be true for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so for many, many years, I had a lot of tiny children, and then we also did a couple house remodeling projects, so there was times we had exposed wires everywhere in our house, and my husband was like, we actually, safety-wise, really shouldn't invite people with children over right now. Um, so I think part of it is just realizing that even if you can't be hospitable to certain types of people or large groups right now, that doesn't mean you're an inhospitable person, and that you have to be, you can push yourself, and I think you should push yourself, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if you're not, your hospitality doesn't look like her hospitality or her hospitality, that doesn't mean you're not. Maybe you're meeting at a park and you're like, hey, I'm gonna bring cupcakes, let's meet at the park and we'll have watch the kids play and have cupcakes. I mean, I've done birthday parties like that before where I couldn't do it at my house. So I was like, bring 40 boys to the park and we'll just eat store-bought cupcakes because <laughs> I'm going to have a baby maybe tomorrow. <laughs> um, and then also, I now that my kids are getting a little older, my hospitality has shifted into a mix of families and then times where it's my kids' friends and larger groups of that age group. And so I, I think that as you're, as you're shifting, that you don't have to always have your hospitality look exactly the same. And I think that's just part of growing up in a Christian community, and it's great. I do too, but usually it doesn't. <laughs> oh, I will. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I was... Um, I was gonna say on a very practical note that it does not have to always be dinner. It, it can be breakfast and it could be dessert and it could be lunch depending on the time of day. So it just- It could just be cheese. I mean, right? It especially- Think cheese. of it, don't make anything. Yes. Put really cheese, cheese on a tray. Yes, and, and then go, and everyone bring wine. Look at that, we're highbrow. Mm. It's crash. <laughs> Um, no, but, but I, I've learned that because, you know, I think I, you know, we, we commonly go to it needs to be dinner, which means it's evening. We've got all these other things that have happened, et cetera, et cetera. And actually there have been, I've learned, like, you know what? Nobody's available here. Can you do brunch on Saturday? Great. Okay, let's do that. And um, that was delightful to have that freeing moment of it. It can be lots of different things or, you know, I don't have time to cook a full dinner, but man, I made three angel food cakes for inexplicable reasons. Let's eat those so that I don't. Um, that's why I have people over, is to eat the galleries. So there you go. I think, I mean, it's, well, I mean, it's kind of obvious that yes, your hospitality has to shift according to the different phases you're in. And so like right now, my kids are a huge help. Well, they're also cresting into the moment where they're all too busy to be a huge help. But it's very different than when they were little and you know, we had five small children, and if we were going to have another family over who was kind of in the same phase, you know, you're talking about 15 people, most of whom are not competent, you know. <laughs> and so it was like, it was sort of like you're cooking this big, like, what are you going to cook for that? And so one thing that I remember doing when my kids were little that turned out to be really pretty fun was if we had another family over, I would get some, like, tacky store-bought kid food for my kids that they never normally got to eat. So it was like super exciting. So it was like Hot Pockets or something. And like we didn't normally eat Hot Pockets ever. So it was like a super treat, like Pop-Tarts. If we were out of town, the kids got to have Pop-Tarts. You know, it was like, whoa, the fanciness knows no bounds. So like I would do that and then I would pack up little brown bags for all of the kids, you know, like all 10 children or whatever with 
that level of food. So I didn't have to stress about it. They felt like it was so exciting. And I would send them upstairs. It was like all disposable. It was in brown bags. And they'd get to watch a movie and eat Hot Pockets and have a kid party upstairs. And it was actually really fun because they kind of got to be hosts. So I would be telling them, you know, like, here's what you need to watch for. And, you know, box drinks or something. And then I could cook a dinner for four. It was actually like a nice dinner. And the four parents could sit downstairs, but everybody's within reach. And everybody felt like that was a super treat. I do not now currently ever buy Hot Pockets and the send teenager. half the, well, three quarters of the dinner party upstairs mm -hmm. with that. Like, so now if I was making a nicer dinner, it's probably for, I don't know, some visiting dignitary or something. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Like, it's a little bit different than when I had a passel of small children, but it was a really fun way to teach them to sort of be the host as well and they could sort of clean up and then they could take dessert up. I don't remember what I did for dessert, Oreos or something. And then I would make something more fun for the adults and it, it was really fun. It was great for everybody. It was just figuring out how to make it happen, I guess. Yeah. I, I want to pass on the words of wisdom my husband gave me one time because it was at some point where I was having a crisis about how not hospitable and not fun I was. It, I'm sure I was pregnant. I like to think I only was this irrational when pregnant, but I don't know. I remember though being near tears. Possibly it was part of crying about something else saying, what kind of a mom never even makes cookies for her kids? Like, like I never make cookies because cookies is too much in my life. And he just, he was real like, well, let's just stop that right now. And he said, but he also said, first you have to make the people to eat the cookies, Rachel. Later you can make the cookies. And, and even though that's not all of our problem, that really is a great way to think of it, that if you have a lot of little kids, it may not be a season of your life where you have people in your house, hardly ever, but you can still be practicing the work that will be making you into a hospitable person. And for me in that phase, it was, I think I gradually eased into trying, it was like trying fun new recipes. Like sometimes we would end up with something and say, we should have someone over to enjoy this with us. But really it was just me being interested in the work of cooking and doing this and trying new recipes. But it took, it was, it was like a phasing plan because then I think I started cooking a lot more to take it to Sabbath and contribute at mom's house. Like I'll do the dessert you know, whatever. Now I do a lot more hospitality, but all of it was part of the same trajectory of just try doing what you could, what was reasonable at that time while holding your other duties. Uh, well, trying to, hold. if you're crying about the cookies, you might need to retreat a little bit and get a grip, but <laughs> okay. So any great tips for someone who is just starting out and being hospitable and what are things that you would tell them to not be discouraged by? I would highly recommend starting not too fancy and use disposable dishes. <laughs> so it's a good start. Do you have any, anybody, things to not be discouraged by also? Or I would say, for me, don't try a new recipe on people. The first time it's I It's a thing I do every time. <laughs> yeah, I was horrible. A friend gave me a recipe for stew, and we were, it was called uh, Dinner Eight. So I had these people, older people, I was young, and <laughs> the stew looked gray with <laughs> peas floating out <laughs> and thin. It was horrible. And these people were older, mature, um, <laughs> and I had been in a hurry, so I piled all the laundry in the one bedroom, and my son Stephen was crying, so this very fancy lady <laughs> went in to pick him up. I thought, oh my word, the laundry's on the bed. That was a disaster. So <laughs> you think I'd learn, but I did it again with dessert one time. But I would say don't try something new on some people <laughs> you don't know. I think I always end up trying new things because somehow the interest of doing it is what gets me through the slumps of like, why am I like repeating something I've done a lot of times is more likely to cause me a crisis than trying to figure out something new, which is not, maybe that's like some people like to bungee jump. I like to, I like to try recipes I've never made in ways I've never made them for people who are coming. 
uh, right now. Okay, I want because of time, I'm going to hustle ahead to some of the actual tips. I feel like the spiritual side of hospitality is quite critical, as you can as you can tell from all these questions. Okay, what is your best kept until until now? Pretty much hospitality secret. What do you rely on the most? Or what under, I'm just going to ask all these and you can pick one that you want. What expected thing do you find not necessary? Are there any rules you consistently break? Any of those? Yeah. I break Jan's rule all the time. I was going to say I break Jan's rule all the time. Like Rachel. Um, I really love pre-cut rectangles of parchment paper. Yes. Um, I have a giant box in my pantry that I buy off Amazon warehouse deals because I don't want to spend a lot of money on them. And I use them all the time for everything. And it makes cleanup so much easier and nothing sticks to anything. Um, that's probably my favorite. And stoneware. I have a tip that I've never actually used myself, but I keep, <laughs> I hold it in reserve because I've always felt like it was so brilliant. I was at somebody's house. Knox was tiny. <laughs> and I had to take him in to use the restroom, and I was trying to, I don't know, hook his overalls or something. And I accidentally bumped the shower curtain, and it clattered, like this horrible noise. And I was like, oh, no. And I opened the curtain, and all the dirty pots were in there. But <laughs> <laughs> the curtain closed, and I was like, no wonder this is a great is tip. so beautiful out there. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great tip if you don't have someone like Becca coming over to look in your stinking shower. I Who looks in I your shower? I didn't snoop, I promise. It <laughs> this, was just this loud crash. The same, the same woman recommended putting your dirty dishes in the oven. Like, yeah. if you got to get them out of your sink, throw them in your oven before people like if you don't. But the trouble there for me is, would I remember that I had filled the oven with dirty dishes? No, you'd start preheating that load of dirty anyway, dishes. I was just impressed. I was <laughs> nothing but impressed, but I've never done it myself, but I'm just throwing that out there. File for it away, lady. Anyone that might help. <laughs> Maybe we could throw the laundry in there. There's a lot of stuff you Don't could look get. look behind the door. You could get a lot of stuff in there. Uh, okay, is there anything unexpected thing that you don't find necessary? I mean, anything people always say you should do that you think is a waste of time? Don't bother sweeping or mopping your house before you have 40 True story. People over. True story. They I will not see it. No. You just have to do it again. Yeah. It's, it's hard. Waves. It's hard to resist that, but know, it is also true that they're going to come in and make it much worse. It's a waste of it's, valuable resources. Yeah. <laughs> because Don't you own the tablecloth, I think, unless it's really egregious. Yeah. And even there, Squirt like. Squirt it with a water bottle yeah, and water bottle. stretch it out mm -hmm. while it's damp. Or put it wet onto the table and let it dry. <laughs> but once you put all of the dishes all over the top of it, after you've set the table, you're not going to see terribly much of it. Other times I've been really I think embarrassed this is what you by say. myself. Won't, so, won't show from a trotting horse. Yes. <laughs> no one will notice. Uh, okay. Uh, what is your best cost conscious tip? Uh, and in terms of affording hospitality, especially big group hospitality, or is there anything that you have found uh, in your experience with that? Um, well, first of all, work with Becca, and you will discover that 30 people, <laughs> it's nothing, it's nothing. 250, now you're talking, um, 400. I think 50 you. is a special threshold, though. It it's like 45, threshold. maybe everything gets way more intense because you're not just <laughs> multiplying. Oh yeah, a recipe. Then you anymore. have to do math, and I don't do well, that. Well, now you have to think of like new vessels yeah. to hold the food. That's another that's problem. What, yeah, you understand trenchers at that point. You're like, um, <laughs> that's why they did that. I but interrupted no. you. No, every totally no, and I'm teasing because Becca's doing different functions than that, and this is in your home, and I'm draping the cord over your foot. But no, it genuinely is like, I remember just recently I had some folks over and we we're going, oh, how are we going to do this? That's a lot of people actually. It's, it isn't actually, it isn't. Oh, it isn't. I do not feel like that is a lot of people. Uh, so thanks for that. But um, no, I was going to say on this one, I've learned um, menu choice, obviously, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, but I've been going so much to like the Middle East, to Mediterranean, to Indian, because things that you can bolster with rice or things you can have extra pitas or extra rolls or pasta and and that can be also easily added to at the last second if 
So everyone's like, my 10 family members are joining us. Absolutely, bring them on. More mm -hmm. pots to boil the rice. Jambalaya. I mean, you know, so finding, but I, I just, I mentioned those because that's kind of fun to play in the exotic, if you will. But in, Also, it's so know, flavorful yes. that, it, that so good. it doesn't matter if you get most, well, maybe you'd notice if you got mostly sauce mm -hmm. on curry. But you can really thin the goods yeah. out in a curry or a spicy sauce. Amen. And all of those are chicken that can, you know, which is usually the cheapest thing. Chicken can be stretched in all of those particular dishes. Mm -hmm. which is probably why those particular cultures also do things like that. So that's been really fun and flavorful and colorful. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Potatoes. Everybody loves potatoes. And you can do so many delicious things with them, and they are so cheap. And they're always a hit. And pasta, unless you have a gluten-free crowd, pasta is... Super cheap and filling. Bread, pasta, potatoes, starches, all the things that are great for your figure. <laughs> They're economical. I'd say fill the teenagers up before dinner. I often put out bread and pizza sauce, do a French bread with, and fill them up or put bowls of chips out so the teenagers are full before we eat. This is a, this is a tip I'm taking straight from here. We... I'm going <laughs> to look for changes this Saturday. <laughs> they eat a lot. We always, we always make the teenagers go through last in the buffet because we always we send everybody else through and then we say, and then the locusts may come through because, <laughs> because if they go through earlier and you see someone stacking five dinner rolls on their plate, you're like, oh, snap. I don't know that there's enough for you to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I would just add eggs are your friend. Um, so you can either do, like Carolyn mentioned earlier, a brunch, but you can even do it at dinner time. So if you're having people over for dinner, you can stretch some sausage and they'll do big stratas and things like that. So either a full on brunch or just egg based uh, savory dishes fill a lot of people for very little money. Mm hmm. And bone in skin on chicken thighs are literally the cheapest meat you can buy. 68 cents a pound right now. One pack. Mm. Is that the frozen? Meet you all there. The fresh ones. Right now. Oh, so yeah. yeah. Like There's it's like $4 for the giant pack. one pack, I can feed 300 people for 100 bucks. So yeah. this is like tested and true, guys. <laughs> Do it. And I have a million recipes, so just come ask me. A million rubs, sauces, braises, all sorts of things. It's, yeah, it does not get old, and it is so so cheap. Yeah, that's a great tip. One thing about that is if drumsticks are also radically cheap, uh, and I will sometimes. This is sort of gross, but whatever. <laughs> I do it anyways. Uh, if you grab, I use a paper towel. You can pull the skin off of the chicken breast. So the bone is still in, but there's not the skin, which means you can fill a Dutch oven with skin off drumsticks and like whatever kind of a sauce. I mean, I think there's a lot, anything that's like a braising, but it's beautiful, but it also is super tender and the bone makes the sauce so much more flavorful and the kids are always super into it. And it is about seven dollars for dinner for 45 i mean it's so cheap and it looks like you've gone above and beyond when there's a huge pile of drumsticks the kids are all, what anyways that is it's it's cheap and effective um food okay what makes larger group hospitality repeatable for you because i think everybody can understand doing it sometime and killing yourself to do it but what are things you've learned to make it something you can just do, you know, regularly or quickly or, well, quickly, relatively speaking. You know, what are the things that have helped you cut some of the time of doing that? For me, it's been recognizing when I hit a fan favorite, when something goes particularly well, as far as a recipe or an execution, I take really, really careful notes. So I actually do that. You can do that in your cookbook in your recipe folder or however. I used to do it that way, but I have since switched over to Google Documents, and I use Google Spreadsheet. Is that the right word? Spreadsheets? Mm -hmm. the, the spreadsheet version. And I do conversions. So I list the ingredients for a recipe, and I take meticulous notes, like, oh, this took more time to cook, this took less time, you know, so that when I'm done, I, I had this much of an ingredient for this recipe for this number of people. 
wow, there were too many leftovers. You know, like just all the notes I could possibly think of so that the next time I go to look at that recipe, I'm like, oh, right. It's mm -hmm. amazing. I, you think you remember, right? I remember how to cook a turkey at Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I, I do it once a year, and I never... I mean, by now I kind of do, but it like took me years to figure out that you forget. You forget after like a day. Yeah. Really I like can that. remember making the same mistake. It's like you, where you're like, now I remember doing the same terrible thing one other Every time. time. Yeah. So I should have taken Unless a note. Unless you write it down. I should have written it out. I'm like, in red. I've lived this red. nightmare already. What am I, <laughs> what am I doing terrible. wrong? <laughs> That's a great tip. Anybody else? I find it's really helpful to have the dishes out and labeled, like this is for the meat, so that I'll, at the last minute it isn't, oh, what am I going to put those that pot of potatoes in? So I found that really helpful. Just and finding the serveware. The, yes, the, all the serving pieces out and backups. I found yeah. that a shortcut. I have a tray for the coffee pot. I bought, they're not even matching, they're just things I picked up at the thrift store. But anytime I see little mugs, because with a crowd, if you only have your big coffee mugs, the coffee will not hold up to it. And then you like three people get a cup of coffee. Uh, so I have a tray of little mugs and I keep them on the tray in the cupboard. So when we're having people over, I pull the tray out and it takes no time at all to do that. And we unload the dishwasher onto the tray and put them back in the cupboard. And it is somehow, it's not our regular coffee cups. It's just coffee cups we use when other people are over that are much smaller. And it means that everybody can have a shot at the coffee, you know, works out. Anything else? Repeatability tips? Um, I was going to say, especially with large crowds and, and holidays and yeah, the extra stress, I've also learned from lovely ladies in my, older ladies in my life of save certain things that are last minute anyway. You're like, I can't pull this out till the end. It needs to be done right away. Okay, well, everybody always shows up, those early people, and they want to help. Mm -hmm. So I will try to prioritize, okay, these things I don't need to stress about because I'm going to get these people showing up and they'll help. The And they like helping. It's a nice time to chat, have an early glass yeah. of wine. Um, those are some of my favorite memories myself as a guest. Mm -hmm. um, and you feel very warm. You know, I'm part of this, I'm part of helping. And so... Um, think about that in your menu or if it's a buffet, whatever, but think about those things that could be saved at the last minute and somebody can help you with it. So. Um, and this might be, I, I just thought I should probably say this because if you're just new to it, you may not have realized this, but very, it's very common that when you invite people over, they're always going to ask, what can I bring? And don't, don't feel bad giving them something to bring. People, they actually want to. Um, and so if you're, if you're intimidated by large groups of people, they might not, like you have to be prepared to make the whole meal because you can't, you know, expect them to. And if they don't offer, I don't want to like force them to do it, especially if they're new to town. But if someone says, hey, can I bring something? Think of something that will be helpful that's not a big burden to them, but that actually can make having a large group a lot more doable and less stressful for you. So um, don't, don't feel like, well, I can't make the whole meal, so I can't invite anyone over because it will be too much for me. I would add if you're having a big crowd and someone offers to bring something, don't count on them bringing enough for the whole crowd. Because if you're inviting someone over who has not traditionally made salad for 50 people, they may not think that, you know, you may say that'd be wonderful. We're having a big crowd. Could you bring salad? And they come with one little bag of Caesar and you're like, oh, that's that's. Oh, you know, it's, it's awkward. So when we've done that, sometimes I ask multiple people to bring salads and just figure, well, how, like, I'll just say, I'll ask people who offer to bring salads tonight. And then we have a couple different salads and that seems to work uh, better. Um, was it repeatable? Is that the question? Yeah. Like, like what are the, yeah. Like to keep going. Cause I think you can all do the I, master, yeah. you know, the one big event, but to yeah. bounce back is a different I think thing. That's kind of what. I hit, I don't know, three or four years ago when we first started doing soup night for the NSA freshmen. And we kind of committed because once you say, we'll have you over every Tuesday, <laughs> then there you are. And there's a lot of hungry college kids. And so I kind of knew at the outset, this has to be sustainable and repeatable for me mm -hmm. to be able to do it. And so I totally second that taking notes. And like the first year... I was trying to find the recipes that would feed the hordes and they have to be hearty. Like, cause you have to know what group are you feeding? Are you feeding? Cause if it's a lot of like 
elderly women. That's very different than having college boys, you know. And so I knew, like, I can't do a clear broth. I can't get away with a tomato bisque. It's like, it has to be very heavy on sausage. And so, <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Like, it has to be really hearty. So I was just, like, looking for any recipes and then keeping very careful track of it. I did it, like, times eight a lot of the time. And then I would keep notes of, like, there were no leftovers or I had a gallon of leftovers or whatever. And I kind of settled into, I wanted to find eight recipes that I could just rely on. I knew that I could just do them without having to think about it. And so then I could do the same thing once a term for NSA. And I figured, whatever, if they have to have the same soup once a term, that's okay. And so the first year was kind of hit and miss, but I was doing soup because it's like, it's one pot. I can't be doing a lot of fiddly things. Um, I teach till 1.30 every day. It has to be something that I can do <laughs> when I pick up the groceries after school, get home, and I have it on, yeah, and I can have whatever. This year, it's like I'm feeding maybe 70 every Tuesday. So it just really has to be something that I know that I can keep up with, which means, yes, careful notes, knowing exactly how many million cans of beans I need to order, that kind of thing. And then... The soup pot, I had to upgrade the soup pot this year. It was just not, I couldn't fit it anymore. So I went up to the 12 gallon. But I can do it in one pot. And I can't wash the pot, but I can cook it. <laughs> so I think we, I think I kind of passed by this. Do you have the one, Katie, I know you brought something to show. Do you have like the one thing you can't live without in your hospitality life? The tool or something. Katie brought. Katie was smart. She knew that if she just said. Yeah. Oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> yep. Oh. Yep. Yep. Katie, you should just really walk like a model with those. I like. <laughs> ooh. Like. <laughs> look at that bowl. <laughs> These are very important items. <laughs> this is a hotel pan. I have a recipe in your handout that talks about hotel pans. <laughs> and so it was important that I brought this to show you because if you haven't worked in the restaurant industry, a lot of, most people don't know what a hotel pan is. So you can find these at Fork Refrigeration, I think here in town, mm -hmm. is, uh, has a section that is all restaurant supply stuff. These are, I think, $20 each. And these are your best friend. They come, this is the two inch, there's four and six inch deep. I cook prime rib in the six inch deep. These are amazing. They clean really well, they stack, they're, they're epic. And they're larger than your regular roasting pan. Mm -hmm. So hotel pans, that is a win. Second of all, this large bowl. This is very, very helpful. So if you are having more than 12 people over, your normal size bowl that you would buy at Williams Sonoma or like places I used to shop, that will not feed more than 12 people. <laughs> so that is why you just need to stop shopping at those fancy places and just go to the cash and carry in Lewiston. And just make your peace with you it already. Buy your kitchen stuff. You buy your kitchen stuff at cash and carry. These are also, I think these are like 15. And there's a whole bunch. I got rid of all my other bowls once I discovered that this is all I really wanted to use. <laughs> and I have eight of them. So, and I just And they slowly, stack so perfectly. They stack, they clean, they're just, <laughs> and they don't even look bad. Like they're neutral, you know? So you're like, oh, my pottery's all mismatched and chipped. This, this does not detract in any way. <laughs> no. I you love know it. What I, mean? I love it. Yes. Yeah. I do want to put in a plug for the hotel pan. The half size that's not that oh, big, yeah. but is six inches deep. They have flat lids. If any of you are sourdough bakers, which I am, I use four of those instead of Dutch oven so I can bake four loaves at one time because it creates the steam in there. When I had a smaller oven, I would put two of them. The oven manufacturers probably don't recommend this, but I would put two of them flat on, it was a convection oven, so I would put two flat on the bottom of the oven 
and then two on the rack and I could bake four loaves at one time. And if you've labored away with 500 degree Dutch ovens, trying to cook one loaf at a time, that should excite you. It excited me when I found out it would work. And I use the like eight inch deep hotel pan at three quarter size with the lid for my flour storage because you can fit 25 pounds of flour in one that's not even as wide as that. Anyway, I also agree. <laughs> Apparently we we all share a love of... <laughs> Touch to cord. <laughs> yeah. Okay, were there anybody else had an answer to that? Okay. Um, okay, next question. How do you go about getting ideas for the menu? I work with Becca. <laughs> I do, this is true. I'm, I don't know really why I'm here. I'm just <laughs> no. um, I love looking at, my mom would grow up, I grew up at lunch, my mom would pull out her cookbooks and read them. And I did not understand that because why? You know, I could be reading Anne of Green Gables or Tolkien or something and mom's reading cookbooks at lunch. And then I discovered that she really enjoyed that. She was teaching herself something. And often, and especially in this day and age, cookbooks are pretty. They are so pretty. <laughs> and um, and they are laid out well, and you find the right person. I'm sure all of you out there probably have favorite people. Um, but I, I learned to go to certain ones, and that's how I found out about the Jerusalem cookbook, by the way. Oh, yeah, that's a great a one. That was from Anything by Otto Lander. Yeah. So, yeah, so looking at books, even if you're just in a bookstore and you're like, ooh, that's a good idea. I went into Ampersand literally last week to get somebody something, and they had a, an Italian appetizer book, and I bought it for me because <laughs> so well and I thought but I'll I will use this I know I will so you find inspiration everywhere Pinterest is great yeah how about how about this do you, do you have a go-to favorite person that you look for for recipes because I would say Ina Garten I think is just foolproof it just seems doesn't she have a cookbook called foolproof I like how yeah, I said I that so. she does but I find that if the recipe sounds good and it's hers it will be good like if you if it appeals to you at all she makes a good version of it. And I do, I personally love her philosophy, which is you're not trying to make food people have never imagined before. You're trying to make the best BLT they've ever had in their life or the best meatloaf or you just want to give them something that's really good, but still familiar and homey. So I love her stuff. Do any of you have a different person you like? Um, I, there are two people that um, I follow on my Instagram feed and often I see something they post in the morning and that's what I go get the groceries for and make that mm -hmm. night for dinner because I don't meal plan. Maybe I should, my life would be easier. But uh, one of them is Half-Baked Harvest. Um, oh, yeah. And when I make something from her, usually my kids are like, oh, this is the best fill in the blank that you've ever made. Uh, she And she cooks for a very large family too. So, And then the other one would be Smitten Kitchen. Like Becca said, mm, if yeah, she makes good. it, she actually makes it until it's perfect. So I know that if I waste my, well not waste, if I use my time to do it, it won't be wasted. I hate it when I make a recipe on a recommendation and then it's gross. It's really depressing. Okay, so moving on. Uh, this one, is there anything you've learned about setting up an event for success? And I put the, the beginning of this is potluck pitfalls. And that's because I have a particular pitfall in mind about potlucks. <laughs> um, something that I had found, this is mostly talking to a friend that lives somewhere else. But the point is they were trying to do regular fellowship meals and it was just turning into a thing about people's preferences, about people's allergies, about people not wanting people being like, don't you think that's a little bit of a heavy menu? You know, like there's expensive. lots. Expensive. That one's that, too This expensive. is too expensive. This is, and it was some kind of a recurring fellowship meal they were doing for their church leadership or something. So it was a big group. And it was just turning into a problem. It was like, this is not fun. Nobody's enjoying this. And and really, if you break it down, you think, well, if if you say, hey, Susie, please make this cheesy buffalo chicken bake, then it it actually does set you up perfectly for her to say, well, Tom doesn't like cheese and I don't want to make that. I mean, like, it does set it up. If you're saying, hey, here's a recipe, you bring this, it, it has opened up the discussion to be a collaborative affair. Uh, and, and in that, which may work great in some circumstances and some friend groups where everyone's totally on the same page, or it may just be bringing up a lot of issues that you wouldn't, if you just have people, if you just say, this is what we're having, welcome, it takes a whole different level of something to come in and say, but we don't like cheese, you know, but if you're asking people to do it themselves, then 
they might give you that feedback and just creates more of a thing. So it's like a class fundraiser because you know, when you have like 13 year olds trying to organize something, it's always a blessing, but they'll be like, why don't you guys bring 64 pounds of pork and you guys bring some baby carrots? You know, like that's how <laughs> or they, it sort or they of say, works. girls, please make a main dish for 20 boys, bring Cheetos. Yeah. And so, but potlucks can end up kind of accidentally doing that some of the time. Yeah. Well, like, why are you asking me to make the cheesy buffalo, whatever it or was? Why did you assign me the thing that's labor intensive and right. other and people are getting? Right, and she only has to yeah. bring a bag of chips. I'm like, well, she's yeah. clearly not <laughs> not capable of making this it's fodder for problems so is there anything else is there any other event event or regular meal things that you've thought you said it already with putting food out for the teenagers yeah and i we have done um, for ladies a salad bar which is really easy for someone supplies usually the host just the salad big bowl of salad and then they just bring toppings and it, it's very casual it's very fresh it's it's easy, so. Yeah. I would say on the social side of things, especially when our kids were really small and needed a lot of our attention during a meal, it's very helpful if you're inviting people you don't really know well or you know and you know they're not very chatty um, to strategically invite someone who you know will help fill the gaps when you're trying to help your little children um, eat their next bite. Because I think going back to the discouragement thing, one thing that can be discouraging is if you go and you, you're like, we're gonna be hospital and you have people over and it feels like you're interviewing them, maybe an FBI interview. You know, you're like <laughs> firing off the questions and then they keep answering them and smiling at you and you're like, oh no, I'm running out of questions. Um, or you just, what I usually end up doing is start talking nonstop, getting more and more um, nonsensical because I'm trying to fill the void of conversation. <laughs> so um, especially if you know that either you and your husband aren't super chatty or that you're gonna be very involved with small children or other things, then just if there's no there's nothing wrong with being strategic and calling up those friends that you that we all have that will help you with that problem. I I remember noticing that it, we we would when our kids were all little we would overwhelm people who came to, they would come to our house and they just sit there with their eyes huge while Luke and I are like frantically feeding children and we're like I mean I think it's just like total chaos while they're like just sitting there and we're like hauling someone off and then coming back and 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 it's good to have thought to have someone who will be there to keep talking to them <laughs> to, to carry it on like this is how we live this is what it's like like, because uh, others is like, visit amongst yourselves <laughs> while we figure this out. Yeah, but but then we'd have a family with a lot of kids, and you realize it's a different art form, people with children holding a conversation, because a kid will come in and interrupt it, everything stops, and then as soon as they leave, everybody picks back up in the conversation. And and that's a, it's interesting. It's like guest dynamics is, an, is a thing to pay attention to. No, anything else? Okay. How do you judge after an event if it's gone well? Do you ever worry that no one had fun, the food wasn't good enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? You did a bad job. That Just was ask weird. ask your husband because he's more objective. Yeah. <laughs> uh, after you've spent the whole day smelling it or even mm -hmm. that whole afternoon smelling it, I'm just... I'm always like, well, that was just the grossest thing. <laughs> and it was also weird. And I think nobody had fun. And the whole thing was terrible and kind of an abomination. And uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, I'm always like, did you think that tasted super funky? <laughs> it's and, true. It, and I think you should just, just assume that you're not going to think it was good. Unless yes. you're like, very, don't unless expect. it's really casual. I mean, if it's something you've been like, I don't know, kind of worked up about for a while, it's guaranteed to be a bomb. <laughs> I mean, in your I own think, mind. I actually think that this is why if I sit down and you take a bite and you're like, wow, <laughs> you start to be like, this is really good <laughs> because it surprises you so much that you're still pleased to see it by the time, <laughs> by the time you sit down, you're just like, hang on, I liked that bite. <laughs> no, I just always like experience. it when Ben's like, no, you're being weird. It was great. <laughs> like, all right, case closed. I was being weird. I'm so glad I'm not alone on that. <laughs> yeah, we like to call it the post-game analysis. <laughs> Let's sit down and talk about that, Judy. All right, over to you, Mark. <laughs> um, but we do, we do, especially as girls, right? 
um, was that good? I don't think so-and-so was having a good time. And, and I wasn't paying enough attention as a hostess to those people over there. And um, I totally spilled everything on the, you know, Mark's going, I didn't notice that. I was laughing with these people. It was great. Yeah, I, I, I echo this. And so there, there can be a point where that could be a problem if we're getting a little too navel-gazy. You don't want to do that, obviously. But it's also great to have my, my male husband's perspective on how things went rather than nitpicking at myself and anything else. You know, if there's genuinely a sin, confess it and move on. If there's not, go, well, that could have maybe gone better. That, you know, Make have. a note of it. Make the note, <laughs> indeed. Um, Put it in your Google Docs. Or it will become a story. Hey, remember the time I bought the cheap Walmart dispenser for my cocktail and it poured all down my sideboard all night and people were tracking it? That's just a fictional story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's hilarious, and it became a thing, and we all laughed about it, and it was great, and my floor was sticky for two weeks. But, but yeah, and it's good to assess. It is good to assess, and it's fine. Yeah. I can remember early on in being hospitable, praying sometime when it was not going well at all. Nothing was going well in advance. And I, I specifically remember that there was a funky dish rag in the laundry somewhere. You know when <laughs> you know when you're starting to get that, like, where is that weird smell coming from? And you're like, people are coming to my house and there is a weird smell up in here. Well, that had happened. And I was, ha and in, anyways, I prayed at that time, Lord, let me be what they need, not what I wanted to give. Like, let this meet a need that I can't even see and let me just offer it freely and let you use it. And that is such a good protection against going down this rabbit hole afterwards, because then you can say, interesting. I wonder why they needed that. <laughs> the Lord will use it. No doubt. This must have been what he ordered for them. Uh, and that's how it is actually relieving to think like, all right, I offered it to the Lord. I wasn't offering it to the guests. I don't need them all to go write a Yelp review about <laughs> the meal. So why get caught up in that if you're offering it to the Lord? It's like, well, we tried. Uh, I might not repeat that. I might hope I don't repeat it because I forgot it and, and uh, do it again. Anybody else? Uh, I was just going to say, if, you, if you're tempted to start like micro critiquing it, um, I, I can't remember any time of getting invited to someone's house, no matter what, you know, tragedies happened, not literal tragedies, um, problems with their meal or, you know, a bathroom that wasn't clean or whatever. It's always a blessing to fellowship. So if I feel that way about being invited as a guest to someone's house, then why would I expect guests to my house to be like, well, they didn't change out the towel in the guest bathroom. So otherwise we would have had a good evening. Or to think that they have to go away, like... And with a great amount of fanfare for what you've done. <laughs> and I, I do believe that the more confident or the more experienced as a hostess that you are, the less people feel like they need to give you their encouragement. Like the more that you're doing it, it is, a, it is like, it is because it looks effortless, the more you've done it, the more people assume it is effortless and they don't feel the need to come buoy you up about it, right? They don't feel the need to come be like, good job making those nachos. You did such a good job. And, it, and it's good to intentionally detach yourself from looking for that even, for thinking that they're here to give you encouragement about what you provided. Too, uh, in line of what you were saying, um, I got in the habit of before people would come and you have that little nervous thing was pray for them, that when they came, they would enjoy themselves and feel loved and it really helped to focus on who was coming. And then the same thing when they were gone. I thought, well, I prayed about it. <laughs> and that's how it turned out. And yeah. It's and so and sometimes hard. I will say, I know I'm. this is me telling a story on behalf of Becca, but sometimes years later, somebody tells you, like you don't even remember having them over. And they say something like, you know, now that I'm married and we have kids, we always think back to that time when we were students in your house and how we want to, and you're thinking, when? Like, you were in my house sometime? And then, and they're remembering some detail that you can't remember and you probably didn't even mean to show them because no, it was probably... I remember being told this by somebody who said, and then you just had to keep taking your kids out to give them swats like <laughs> over and over and over and over. And I was like, did we... Interesting. <laughs> that sounds like one of those ones I just deleted. You're like from at, my the, at the end at the end of that <laughs> evening. And then she was saying, you know, just like how much that was an encouragement now to them looking back now that they're in the same phase or you know, like whatever. And that's when you and have to have great. confidence that God actually yeah. is using this in his own way. He's not doing like you set out to be hospitable. 
but it's not, we're not doing something like we don't choose the target and we don't execute perfectly what God is doing with it. We're obeying him and he uses it for his pleasure. And it's such a joy to be part of that. But a lot of the time you're surprised. You're like, really? That was a low point for me. Like that, <laughs> that was a moment I never wanted uh, to go back, back to. All right. Well, ladies, thank you so much for coming. I hope that you're encouraged to dig into hospitality some more. And thank you, ladies, for all coming to talk with us. Thanks, ladies.